Hey everyone, today we are looking into the lives of various 19th and 20th century figures who you might not have heard about. These women all had incredible and interesting stories, so be sure to stick around to see the hardships that they had to endure and how they made their fortunes. For our first story, we are going back to early 20th century Oklahoma. Sarah Rector was born on the 3rd of March 1902 in the city of Muskogee, Oklahoma. Her father was Joseph Rector and her mother was Rose McQueen. She had five siblings and despite coming from a humble background, a stroke of luck would completely change her life. To understand Sarah's story, first we have to look back at her ancestors. Both her maternal grandmother and paternal great-grandfather had been enslaved by Muscogee Creek Indians. In 1866, following the Civil War and the abolishment of slavery, Sarah's ancestors were declared freedmen by the US government and were now citizens of the tribes that had previously enslaved them. In 1887, the federal government introduced the Dawes General Allotment Act in which they stripped even more Native Americans of their land. This was because the government deemed all of the tribal land to be an excess which the tribes did not need. Thus, it was divided and transferred free of charge to white settlers. In 1898, Congress passed the Curtis Act, which amended the Dawes Act. This new legislation divided Oklahoma, which was transitioning from Indian Territory, to state status. This was an obligatory step in order to form the new state of Oklahoma. However, a major difference was that not only white settlers were granted free land from what was former Indian Territory, the unassigned lands were also given to tribes residing in the area. As a descendant from Creek slaves, and later having the status of freedmen, Sarah, as well as two of her siblings, were each entitled to a plot of land. Sarah's was approximately 160 acres. This distribution took place between 1898 until 1906. As a result, nearly 1 million acres of land in eastern Oklahoma was granted as land allotments to children from the Creek Nation. This included around 4,400 black children and thousands of Muscogee Freedmen miners. In total, the Curtis Act stripped tribes of about 90 million acres. Furthermore, upon distributing this excess land, the federal government gave tribal members such as Sarah undesirable land which was considered to be rocky, have infertile soil and thus not suitable for farming. Meanwhile, the more valuable, fruitful pieces of land were reserved for white settlers. However, what the government hadn't predicted was that under the surface of much of the land given to the younger generations was an extremely valuable fossil fuel. The land issued to Sarah Rector was located in Glenpool, about 60 miles from her family home. Growing up, she and her family were quite poor, with her father not being able to afford the annual property tax on his children's allotted land. The $30 that Joseph Rector, Sarah's father, had to pay for his daughter's land was a burden. Due to this, Joseph petitioned to the Muscogee County Court in order to sell the land. However, as Sarah was still a minor, this request was denied. He had to continue paying the tax, which was a heavy strain on the already poor family. In February 1911, Joseph came to an agreement with the Standard Oil Company, leasing Sarah's land to them, finally relieving him of financial strain. Two years later, B.B. Jones, an independent oil driller known as the Millionaire Oil Man, drilled a well on the property, which produced a gusher. Luckily for Sarah, under her land was crude oil. Jones started to operate the property, and within a few months, tens of thousands of barrels of oil were being produced each day. At this point in time, the law in Oklahoma required that all children who were citizens of Indian Territory 
with significant property and money, be assigned so-called well-respected white guardians. This meant that even if their parents were alive, they wouldn't manage their children's wealth. Soon, Rector was receiving a fortune in royalties as a result of the discovery. However, in order to comply with the law, there were calls from people around the local area to change Sarah's guardianship. So, a judge appointed a local white resident named TJ Porter to oversee all of Sarah's financial affairs. It should be noted that he wasn't a complete stranger as he was known to the Rector family. News of this discovery soon reached headlines around the nation. Sarah was now meant to be earning thousands of dollars a month at just 11 years old. One account states that in October 1913 alone, she received royalties of $11,500. Apparently, due to her growing fortune, in 1913, the Oklahoma legislature even made an effort to have her declared white, so that she could ride in a first-class car on trains. Newspaper reports stated that Sarah's income exceeded that of the president's and that she became known as the richest black girl in America. Yet, despite her massive income, rumors persisted that her living conditions remained the same. Supposedly, she continued to live in a two-room shack with her large family. Still impoverished, many began to question what was happening to her wealth. In 1914, the African-American newspaper the Chicago Defender heard of Sarah's story and the rumors surrounding her poverty. They later published an article which claimed that Sarah, as well as her siblings, were uneducated, had poor living conditions, and that her wealth was being mismanaged. The article caught the attention of several prominent African Americans who became concerned for her living conditions and guardianship. Soon after, an investigation was launched to determine whether or not TJ Porter was properly handling Sarah's wealth. In June, a memo was sent by James C. Waters Jr., who was an agent affiliated with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. William Du Bois received the memo, and in it, Waters detailed that Sarah's estate was in fact being mismanaged. According to him, Sarah received no education, wore cheap dresses, and no shoes. Meanwhile, her guardian earned a large sum of money. Waters went on to add, Is it not possible to have her cared for in a decent manner, and by people of her own race, instead of by a member of a race which would deny her and her kind the treatment accorded a good yard dog? It wasn't long until papers across the country challenged the position of Sarah's guardian. Furthermore, other similar cases to Sarah's were being highlighted. Hundreds of native black children had found wealth due to oil discoveries on their land, and just like Sarah, had been appointed a white guardian who frequently mismanaged their estate. Papers across the nation questioned why it wasn't possible for a black guardian to be appointed. Sarah's case became the focal point for this issue. It should be stated that the exact details regarding Sarah and her guardian remain unclear. Shortly after the press brought this issue to light, a correspondence between Du Bois and the Judge Leahy revealed that Sarah along with her family had moved into a five-room cottage and that she was attending school in her hometown of Taft along with all her siblings. The judge also told Du Bois that it was the family who had chosen Porter to be the guardian and that he only received 2% of Sarah's income. Also, white-owned papers stated that Judge Leahy was very strict on guardians if any discrepancies occurred. Even if the situation regarding Sarah's guardianship was greatly exaggerated, the NAACP's investigation brought to light the existing issues of guardianship and the corruption that came with it, meaning less children would be neglected and exploited. Furthermore, Du Bois later established 
the Children's Department of the NAACP, which investigated claims of white guardians who were suspected of depriving black children of their land and wealth. Sarah and her older sister then left school in Taft and received a better education, being enrolled in the Tuskegee Institute's Children's School. While at the school, a group of criminals had plotted to kidnap Sarah and demand a ransom. Fortunately, various students prevented the abduction. Yet sadly, Sarah's wealth made her a frequent target for violence and exploitation. This may be one of the reasons why she stayed away from the press in later life. In 1915, production on Sarah's allotment was approximately 160,000 barrels of crude oil a month. As Sarah had a one-eighth share, she earned about $18,000 a month, around $460,000 today. At the time, the average household income was just less than $60 a month. To put into perspective just how much money she earned, her daily income was more than the annual salary of most Americans at the time. Due to the immense press coverage of her life and story, Sarah began to receive gifts requests for loans, and most notably, marriage proposals from much older men, despite the fact that she was still a young teenage girl. Undoubtedly, these men simply wanted to control her fortune. In 1917, the family moved to Kansas City, Missouri, and within a few years, they moved into a beautiful brick mansion known as the Sarah Rector Mansion. By the time Sarah was 18, she was easily a millionaire. She owned various businesses and assets, including stocks, a boarding house, and land. Sarah's mother, known to the family as Mama Rose, was in charge of her daughter's finances until she was 20. Not long after moving to the city, Sarah met a local businessman called Kenneth Campbell. The couple married in 1920. The wedding was very private, with only close relatives having attended. The pair had three sons and later divorced in 1930. By March 1922, Sarah's wealth was estimated to be over $1 million, around $15.5 million in today's money. Rector enjoyed her wealth, living a comfortable life. She enjoyed fine clothing, which meant some designer stores that only typically admitted whites would close and only allow the rectors to shop. Sarah and her mother also enjoyed fancy fast cars, such as Cadillacs, Lincolns, and Rolls Royce. The two were known to race around the city, leading to Sarah especially getting many speeding tickets. Sarah was known to have a lavish life, throwing grand parties at her home for leading members of the nation's African-American community, such as jazz celebrities. Despite this, it's thought that she lived a quiet life in Kansas City, with details about her later life being difficult to come by. Sarah lost a lot of money following the Wall Street crash of 1929, particularly as the year before, she and her husband created a car dealership, which went bust. After her divorce, Sarah married William Crawford, a restaurant owner, in 1934. Sarah Rector died on the 22nd of July 1967, aged 65, from a cerebral hemorrhage. She was then buried in Taft Cemetery, which was her hometown. Next, we are heading to early 19th century Georgia. Biddy Mason is believed to have been born on the 15th of August 1818 in Hancock County in Georgia, though we cannot be certain of these details. She was named Bridget at birth, but became known as Biddy in her youth and would retain that name for the remainder of her life. Biddy was born into slavery, as Georgia in the deep south of America was still a slave-owning state, and would remain so for nearly 50 years. What was worse, in her youth Biddy was separated from her parents, and sold to a Georgia plantation owner, Robert Smithson. While her youth and indeed much of her early adult years were arduous and spent in slavery, she did learn many skills during this time, which would allow her to prosper in later years. For instance, on the plantation of Robert Smithson, who had purchased her from her original owner in the 1820s, 
she learned much about husbandry and agriculture. Also, others who were enslaved there taught her about the folk medicine, which had been brought from Africa to the United States and passed down from generation to generation. She also learned the skills of the midwife during these years. In 1836, Biddy was either given away as a wedding present or sold to Robert and Rebecca Smith, a young couple who had a plantation to the west in the state of Mississippi. She would spend the next 10 years of her life there, during which time she had three children, all daughters. Ellen was born in 1838, Anne in 1844, and Harriet in 1847. It has been speculated that her enslaver Robert Smith fathered these children, but there is no definitive evidence to confirm this. In 1847, some Mormon missionaries arrived to Mississippi to begin converting the locals to the new Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is often informally known as the LDS Church, or Mormon Church. This was founded by Joseph Smith in the west of New York State in the 1820s, after he claimed to have experienced a series of divine revelations, and the church grew considerably in the years that followed. As they did, they began moving westwards to find an American Zion on the frontier of the United States. By the 1840s, they had outposts in parts of Illinois, Ohio and Missouri, but the rising strength of the church in these regions also aroused opposition, and in 1844, Smith was killed in a riot in Illinois. Nevertheless, his followers remained committed to the cause, and Mormon groups were continuing to head south and westwards in the years that followed, in search of new converts. And it was one such group of Mormons who arrived at the Smith Plantation in Mississippi in 1847. Not long after the Mormon mission arrived to Mississippi, Robert Smith converted to the LDS Church, and he then decided to move to Utah, as the leaders of the Mormon Church had headed there to establish a new frontier community. He took his family and slaves with him, including Biddy and her three daughters. There, Joseph Smith's successor as head of the church, Brigham Young, had led his people to Salt Lake Valley, and they were beginning to establish a settlement which had become the heart of Mormonism, Salt Lake City. It was here that the Smiths and the wider convoy which they were a part of, headed in 1847, crossing through Colorado in 1848 and arriving to Utah. Along the way, Biddy's medical skills were useful, and she was an integral member of the convoy. When they finally arrived to Utah, Smith and his group settled at the town of Cottonwood, not far from Salt Lake City. The Church of Latter-day Saints was not an abolitionist religious denomination. Indeed, Brigham Young was clearly possessed of an antipathy towards the African American people, and slavery was allowed in Salt Lake City and the surrounding settlements. However, in 1851, a decision was made by Young which, on the face of it, opened up the possibility of Biddy acquiring her freedom. Back in 1848, the United States had acquired a vast amount of territory stretching from Texas to the Pacific Ocean in the peace settlement of the Mexican-American War. This included the region known to the Mexicans as Alta California, but which quickly became the US state of California. It was also in 1848 that extensive gold seams were discovered out in California, and as news of this spread, a massive rush of tens of thousands of gold prospectors and other adventurers began heading west to California. The gold rush of 1849 and the years that followed saw the state develop extremely quickly, and Brigham Young was anxious that the Church of Latter-day Saints would have a presence in the California region. Consequently, in 1851, he dispatched a mission southwest to San Bernardino in California. He instructed those who went on the journey that when California had been admitted to the Union in 1850 as the 31st state, it did so as a free state. As such, enslaved people could not be owned in the state, and anyone who brought their slaves with them from Utah to California would be effectively granting them their freedom. Thus, when Robert Smith decided to join the mission to California with his family and slaves, it appeared that Biddy would soon win her freedom, but Smith had other ideas. Robert Smith did not set his slaves free upon arriving in California, 
and many enslaved individuals like Biddy were completely unaware that they were entitled to their freedom upon entering the state. Moreover, in the early 1850s, the Californian authorities were generally reluctant to prosecute slave owners who entered the state with slaves and did not set them free. As such, Biddy and her daughters remained enslaved for several years after arriving in California. In 1855, one of Biddy's daughters, Ellen, began seeing a free black man named Charles Owens. It was from Owens that Biddy learned that California law had banned slavery and that Biddy had the right to appeal legally against her and her daughter's ongoing status as the slaves of Robert Smith. Owens then helped her file a petition to that effect in the Los Angeles County Court. Biddy would not be allowed to speak on her own behalf, but as her enslaver Robert Smith failed to appear, a decision was made to grant Biddy and her three daughters their freedom, in line with California law. Thus, the case was adjourned in January 1856, when Biddy was around 38 years old. At this juncture, Biddy elected to take the name Mason as her surname. This had been the middle name of Amasalinum, a Mormon in San Bernardino for whom Biddy had worked for some time and whom she must have respected. Upon winning her and her daughter's freedom in 1856, Biddy and her daughters went to live with the Owens family, who had helped her appeal her case in law, and her daughter Ellen soon married Charles Owens. Biddy secured work as a nurse, putting the medical skills she'd obtained growing up in Georgia to good use. She soon prospered in this profession, as California was ravaged by a smallpox outbreak in the late 1850s and early 1860s while her skills as a midwife were constantly in demand. Mason lived frugally and saved her money during this time. By 1866, she had saved enough money to buy a house of her own on Spring Street in Los Angeles for $250. This was a cheap rate, as Spring Street was on the periphery of Los Angeles at the time, but as the city expanded rapidly, it became a more central location. In purchasing it, Biddy became one of the first black women to own property in California, and she soon owned more. The same frugality that she had displayed in her first years of freedom continued into the 1870s, and Biddy began using the money saved up to buy up cheap real estate on the edges of the city, which she then sold a few years later for a handsome profit, as property values continued to increase around Los Angeles. By the early 1880s, she had accumulated considerable wealth, and used this to begin erecting commercial buildings in the city, which she then rented out as office spaces. As a result of this keen business sense, and her prowess from the California real estate industry, by the late 1880s, Binnie Madison, the woman who was born as a slave in Georgia 70 years earlier, had accumulated a fortune estimated at about $300,000 the equivalent of approximately $10 million in today's money. Biddy's activities extended beyond her business interests. In 1872, she and her son-in-law Charles Owens also co-founded the Los Angeles branch of the First African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first African-American church in Los Angeles. The meetings in which the establishment of the church was planned out and organized were held in Mason's home on Spring Street. The land on which the church was constructed was also donated directly by her. Mason is also widely regarded today for her philanthropy and charitable activities. For instance, she is credited with playing a significant role in establishing the first elementary school in the city for African American children. She also made considerable donations to local charities and causes once her own private wealth allowed her to do so. Some of these activities are quite striking. Mason would, for example, often visit jail inmates in her region to see what could be done to provide them with legal aid. In the 1880s, when severe floods struck Los Angeles and many thousands of people were left destitute, Mason opened accounts in her name in several grocery stores, and through these paid for the shopping of the flood victims for many weeks thereafter. Finally, in her later years, she effectively turned her home into a mixture of an orphanage and a care home for the destitute. 
People visited here every day for relief from their poverty, and when Bidi was no longer able to meet them at the gate outside, as her health declined, her grandson would bring them inside to meet with her in the house. Unsurprisingly, given all of this, Bidi became known within the African American community in Los Angeles as Grandma Mason. Mason died on the 15th of January 1891 at 73 years of age in Los Angeles. Although she had become an esteemed figure within her community, both for her philanthropy and her religious activity, she was nevertheless buried in an unmarked grave at Evergreen Cemetery, located in the Boyle Heights district of the city. It was only nearly 100 years later that her contribution to early California history was recognized when a large tombstone was erected over her grave in 1988. A year later, the California Afro-American Museum held an exhibit honoring her life and declared the 16th of November 1989, Biddy Mason Day. Today, Biddy Mason Memorial Park in Los Angeles is named in her honor. Thus, a century after her time, Mason's remarkable story was brought to greater public awareness. For our next story, we are going back to 1860s Louisiana. Sarah Breedlove was born on the 23rd of December, 1867, on a cotton plantation near Delta, Louisiana. Her parents, Owen and Minerva Breedlove, as well as her five older siblings, were born into slavery, working on Robert W. Burney's Madison Parish plantation. Eventually, the family became free and began working as sharecroppers. Unlike the rest of her family, Sarah was born free thanks to the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. Sarah's early life was full of hardships. In 1872, her mother sadly passed away. Although the cause is unknown, it was most likely from cholera. Just a year later, her father also died. She was just six years old and was now an orphan. Following this, she went to Vicksburg, Mississippi to live with her older sister, Luvenia, and her brother-in-law, Jess Powell. She was as young as 10 years old when she started working as a domestic servant. Sarah didn't receive any real education as a child. The best she got was literacy lessons on Sundays at her local church. She later stated that, I had little or no opportunity when I started out in life. Sarah disliked living with her sister, as her brother-in-law mistreated her. Because of this, she married when she was just 14 to escape his abuse. Just three years later, she had a daughter called Alelia, who was born on the 6th of June, 1885. When Sarah was just 20 years old, she became a widow after her first husband, Moses McWilliams, died just two years after the birth of their daughter. Subsequently, Sarah took her daughter to St. Louis, where her brothers had established themselves as barbers. Sarah then found work as a laundress, earning just over a dollar a day. When she wasn't working, Sarah sang in the choir of the St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. She soon became determined to give her daughter a formal education, as well as to become an educated woman herself. So, she began attending night school. A few years later, Sarah started to experience hair loss. This was due to a variety of factors, including skin disorders, harsh products, a poor diet, and a lack of hair washing. To improve her situation, Sarah started to experiment with hair care treatments, as well as home remedies. In 1894, Sarah married a man called John Davies, yet they divorced around nine years later. In 1904, she was hired by Annie Turnbull Malone as a commission agent. The products she sold for her employer were aimed at the African-American hair care market. While Sarah was working for Malone, she began to develop her own products of hair treatment. She then moved to Denver, Colorado in July 1905. At that time, she was 37 years old. In Denver, she continued to work as a commission agent for a while, 
but then quit once she established herself as a hairdresser and retailer of cosmetic creams. Her former employer Malone accused Sarah of stealing her formula, yet the mixture had been around for hundreds of years. In January 1906, Sarah married a man she had known from when she lived in St. Louis. Her husband was a salesman called Charles Joseph Walker. Following this, Sarah was known as Madam C. J. Walker. The couple promoted the business with Charles taking charge of advertising. One strategy that Madam Walker used was door-to-door -door selling. Slowly but surely, she taught other African-American women how to properly look after their hair. In 1906, Madam Walker's 21-year-old daughter, Alalia, was put in charge of the mail order operation in Denver. Meanwhile, her mother and stepfather traveled throughout the South and Southeast, giving demonstrations of her Walker method in an attempt to expand the business. The Walker method involved preparing the scalp using special lotions such as shampoo, her custom-made pomade, as well as brushing hair with iron combs. This method promoted hair growth, improved the condition of the scalp, and made weak hair become soft and strong. Although Madam Walker had several competitors, making it difficult to break into the market, her personal approach to sales won her loyal customers. Her saleswomen were called beauty culturalists, or Walker agents. They were successful in selling products by emphasizing the importance of health, cleanliness, and loveliness. Soon they became known in many African-American communities throughout the states. As the business expanded, in 1908, Madame Walker and her husband moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There, Walker established Lelia College to train hair culturists. Also, she opened a beauty parlor, further expanding the business. Madame Walker trained licensed sale agents, teaching them the Walker system. Her employees earned nice commissions, which allowed these women to be economically independent. Madame Walker's daughter, Elelia, was in charge of day-to-day -day operations in Pittsburgh. Two years later, Madame Walker decided to set up her new base of operations in Indianapolis. As a new headquarters for the business, Madame Walker purchased a factory and built more hair salons and beauty schools to expand her business. She even bought herself a nice new home. By now, her company had become extremely successful. Madame C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company was making profits equivalent to several millions of dollars in today's money. It was also around this time that Alelia came up with the clever idea of establishing an office and a beauty salon in New York City. She saw how the Harlem neighborhood was growing and within three years, it became a thriving area of African-American culture. As the company was ever expanding, Madame Walker increased staff in order to cope. She hired many women into key management positions, even though this was uncommon at the time. Moreover, as she expanded her business, she started to voice her opinion. She became a major philanthropist and activist, trying to improve the lives of women and African Americans. In 1912, Walker spoke at an annual gathering of the NNBL, stating, I am a woman who came from the cotton fields of the South. From there, I was promoted to the wash tub. From there, I was promoted to the cook kitchen. And from there, I promoted myself into the business of manufacturing hair goods and preparations. I have built my own factory on my own ground. A year later, she donated a large amount of money to raise funds for the construction of a YMCA building in Indianapolis. She also created educational scholarships, donated money to elderly homes, as well as many other organizations, such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the National Conference on Lynching. From 1911 to 1919, business boomed. 
Walker's company employed thousands of people, many of whom were women. As profits increased, in 1913, Madame Walker and her husband Charles divorced. Around this time, she travelled to the Caribbean and parts of Latin America to promote her business. While travelling, she recruited new beauty culturalists, teaching them the Walker method. In 1916, she returned from her promotional campaign. Again she relocated, leaving the operations in Indianapolis to her forewoman so she could move into a new townhouse in Harlem. From there, Madame Walker oversaw that business was running smoothly. By 1917, her company had trained nearly 20,000 women. Her employees were dressed in an unmistakable uniform which consisted of white shirts and black skirts. To sell her products efficiently, her commission agents would visit homes all over the US, offering their top range of products. This combined with the heavy advertising Walker did, such as in African American newspapers and magazines, led to her products selling in the masses. Nevertheless, Walker wasn't just about making money for herself. She gave back to the community, teaching other African Americans essential skills such as budgeting, how to start up a business, and encouraged all to become financially independent. In 1917, she established the National Beauty Culturalist and Benevolent Association of Madame C.J. Walker agents. That year, the association had a conference where the women discussed business and commerce. Moreover, prizes were given to those with the best sales figures in the company, as well as those who had made large contributions to local charities. In May 1918, Walker moved into her new home called Villa Luaro. Her Italian-style mansion cost her $250,000 to build and was designed by an accomplished African-American architect Gudvertner Tandy. The house is located in Irvington on Hudson, New York. While in New York, Walker gave lectures regarding political, economic and social issues that existed in the US. Throughout her life, she fought for the rights of African Americans. During World War I, she advocated for the establishment of a training camp for black army officers. She also joined the Executive Committee of National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and was elemental in the organization of the silent protest parade which was attended by around 10,000 African Americans in order to protest lynchings and violence faced by African Americans. Furthermore, Walker donated $5,000, around $75,000 in today's money, to the NAACP's anti-lynching fund. Sarah Walker died in her mansion on the 25th of May, 1919, due to kidney failure and hypertension, aged just 51. A funeral service took place in her home, Villa Luaro, and she was later buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, New York. When she died, Walker was the richest African-American woman in the States. She had only recently become a millionaire, as two years earlier, she had stated that she wasn't yet a millionaire, but hoped to become one soon in order to use that money for the good of others. Her net worth was estimated between half a million and a million dollars. In her will, she left one third of her estate to her daughter. Meanwhile, the rest was donated to various charities and institutions. Her daughter, Alalia Walker, became the president of Madame C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company and an important part of the Harlem Renaissance. The Madame Walker Theatre Centre in Indianapolis started construction prior to Walker's death. It was finally opened in 1927. For decades it would go on to be an important cultural centre for African Americans. The theatre, as well as her mansion, Villa Liwaro, were later listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Finally, in 1981, the Madame C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company 
ceased operations. As part of its Black Heritage series, the US Postal Service issued a stamp of Walker in 1998. In honour of Walker's legacy, Sun Dior Brands and Sephora launched a cosmetic line called Madame C.J. Walker Beauty Culture. Next, we are heading to 1870s Illinois. The woman known widely today as Annie Malone was born as Annie Minerva Turnbull in the small town of Metropolis in the state of Illinois on the 9th of August 1877. It should be noted that some accounts inaccurately give her year of birth as 1869. Her father was Robert Turnbull and her mother was Isabella Cook, both of whom had formerly been enslaved in Kentucky. When the American Civil War broke out in 1861, the pair had fled north to Illinois with Robert eventually joining the Union Army as part of the 1st Kentucky Cavalry. Annie was the 10th of 11 children, but sadly her parents died when she was still young, and so she and her siblings were orphaned. In the time that followed, Annie acquired some formal education, showing an interest in the sciences, particularly chemistry, but this was cut short owing to her circumstances and frequent illness. Eventually, she ended up relocating to Peoria in the early 1890s as a teenager, a growing mid-sized town in Illinois where Annie's oldest sister Laura Roberts was living. There, Annie worked for the first time as a hairdresser and began showing an interest in beauty products and hair care styling at a time when the availability of new chemicals and products was transforming how people could potentially style their hair. By the early 1900s, as she headed into her mid-twenties, Annie had developed enough knowledge about the hair care industry to establish her own small business. This was based out of the town of Lovejoy, Illinois, where she had relocated to in the late 1890s. Here, Annie began selling hair oils, hair straighteners, and a wide range of other products which claimed to help stimulate hair growth or cure alopecia. Annie's small business endeavour was successful owing to the changing social circumstances of the time. The turn of the century was a time in which there was a burgeoning African-American middle class in the United States, particularly in northern states like Illinois, where segregation and the Jim Crow laws were not in force. In this environment, many African-American women wanted to groom their hair in a certain way, to affirm their social aspirations and societal status. And so, there was room for entrepreneurs like Turnbull to make a good living from selling hair care and beauty products aimed specifically at African American women. While she had done well in Illinois in the early 1900s, it was really when she moved to the city of St. Louis in 1902 that Annie began to meet with great success in her business efforts. The Mound City grew from just 100,000 people in the middle of the 19th century to nearly 700,000 people by 1910, many of them being African Americans, heading north from the segregated south as part of the Great Migration, and so there was a huge market to be captured here. There she opened a shop on Market Street and began advertising her products and services in black neighbourhoods and newspapers. She also managed to branch out into white neighbourhoods by employing white salespeople. Annie's business flourished on the back of a specific product, one which she had developed herself, and which was good at straightening curly African-American hair. Her product appears to not have damaged the hair or the scalp, unlike other products of the time, and was a hit with her customers. What was more, she did not rely on the sales of the product in a hairdresser's or salon, but went door-to-door -door in African-American neighbourhoods selling the product. Soon it was successful enough that she was employing other people to help as part of a growing sales team. By the 1910s, she was one of the most successful businesswomen in the American Midwest, at a time when African-American economic and social fortunes were booming. While Annie Malone was a very successful woman by the 1910s and was making enough money to live well, she wanted to expand further again. To that end, in 1917, she founded Poro College in St. Louis, a cosmetology school, as an offshoot to her beauty business and as a means to contribute to the empowerment of African-American women. The complex of Poro College in St. Louis was very substantial, consisting of Malone's business offices, the manufacturing operation for her products, classrooms, training centers for staff, laboratories, an auditorium and conference center, dormitories, guest rooms, and a warehouse and shipping center. As such, 
It became the main centre for the production and shipping of Milan's hair care and beauty products, while also being a centre where women came to be trained in the cosmetics and hair care treatments which Milan offered. This was a franchise business, with African American women coming to train at Poro College before heading off to other parts of the country to start their own offshoots of Poro College. Malone was way ahead of her time in integrating Poro College into the community and making it a place where workers had the best of services available to them. As well as being a community outreach centre, the college had a smoking parlour, cafeteria, dining rooms, a bakery, medical centre, laundry services, an on-site seamstress and even an ice cream parlour, gym and roof garden. This was a forerunner of the kind of campuses which Apple and Google were to build out in California many decades later. Poro College was enormously successful as a business franchise. In the course of the 1920s, it trained tens of thousands of young women in the basics of cosmetics and hair care, who then returned to their own cities and towns as brand ambassadors, often stocking Malone's beauty and hair care products in their salons for years to come. In total, it is estimated that Poro College trained over 70,000 women between the late 1910s and the early 1940s, while at its height in the mid-1920s, the college employed approximately 170 people on site in St. Louis. Eventually, franchised offshoots of Pora were to be found across North America and as far afield as the Caribbean, South America, the Philippines and parts of Africa. By that time, Annie was a self-made millionaire. In 1926 alone, she paid $40,000 in taxes, the equivalent of about three quarters of a million dollars in today's money, a huge sum which is indicative of the extent of her business empire by that time. Although she generally lived a frugal lifestyle, she did splash out on one specific status symbol, becoming reputedly the first woman in Missouri to own a Rolls Royce. She also spread this wealth through Poro College in ways which incentivized the business. For instance, women who had worked as agents for the business for five years were given an expensive service ring to acknowledge their commitment to Poro on that anniversary. Annie Malone is known today as one of two African-American women who simultaneously became self-made millionaires in the interwar period by selling hair care and beauty products. The other was Madame C.J. Walker, and their two stories were deeply intertwined and their life histories overlapped in many significant ways. Madame C.J. Walker was a contemporary of Annie's who was born as Sarah Breedlove in Louisiana in 1867. Like Annie, she was born to freed slaves and was orphaned at a young age. As a young woman, she too moved to St. Louis, where in 1904, she began working for Annie. She continued in that position for over a year, before heading out to Denver, Colorado with her daughter and new husband, Charles Walker. In Colorado, Walker set up her own hair care business, using a product which was very similar to that which Annie was selling back in St. Louis, one which used a mixture of petroleum jelly, sulfur, and other ingredients to straighten extremely curly hair. The Madame C.J. Walker Company, which she established, became very successful, and much of her business model mirrored that of Annie Malone in St. Louis. Unsurprisingly then, Annie soon accused her former employee of having stolen her ideas and intellectual property. But the charge never stuck, and Walker's business continued to thrive. In the course of the 1910s and 1920s, both companies became multi-million dollar enterprises, but the Madame C.J. Walker Company was more successful and is more remembered today. In fact, Walker refused to acknowledge Annie Malone's impact on her business and life, despite it being Malone who had trained her and laid the foundations for the industry. You may be wondering why Annie Turnbull is known more widely as Annie Malone. Well, as you may have guessed, it was owing to her marital affairs. Annie first married Nelson Pulp on the 25th of June 1902, shortly after relocating to St. Louis. Not much is known about this marriage, other than that it proved unsuccessful and the couple divorced in 1907. Thereafter, she lived with her brother William for some years on Pine Street in St. Louis. Annie acquired the Malone name in 1914, when late that spring she married Aaron E. Malone, a former school teacher who had changed careers to become a door-to-door -door salesman of religious books. This second marriage was initially happy, and in the years that followed, Aaron became involved in Annie's business, manufacturing her hair tonic by the late 1910s. But matters soured in the 1920s, 
perhaps owing to Annie spending large amounts of time travelling as her business empire grew. In 1927, Aaron filed for divorce, demanding half of her business as part of the settlement, claiming that he had helped build it. The case generated much press attention in St. Louis and further afield at the time, with Annie eventually settling for a payment of $200,000, a fortune in the mid-1920s, though the payment did allow her to maintain control of the company herself. Though her married life had been tumultuous, Annie compensated for her domestic turmoil by investing her wealth in numerous philanthropic endeavours in the 1920s and 1930s. For instance, she made large donations to Howard University College of Medicine, a historically black research institution in Washington DC. Many years later, the college reciprocated by awarding her an honorary degree. Yet her most prolific philanthropy, which was clearly close to her heart given her own childhood, was in supporting the St. Louis African American Orphans Home, to which she donated the equivalent of millions of dollars in modern terms during the 1920s and 1930s, serving on the board of directors for much of that time. Following her divorce in 1927, Annie began relocating her business to Chicago, and she eventually moved there herself in the 1930s. Such was her wealth by that time that she was able to purchase an entire city block of property. But bleaker times followed. Although poor old college survived the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression, its business was still greatly reduced for much of the 1930s, and this, combined with multiple lawsuits which Annie had to deal with as individuals tried to claim part of her wealth, ensured that she was cash poor by the mid-1930s. She sold some of her properties in St. Louis to compensate, and remained afloat. In 1939, the original Poro College building on Ferdinand Street in St. Louis fittingly became the site of the first African-American law school in Missouri. By that time, Annie was winding down her involvement in the business to a considerable extent, which had always functioned as a franchise, and took on a new life without her company in the late 1930s and into the 1940s. Annie lived out her last years in Chicago on South Parkway. She suffered a stroke there in the late spring of 1957, and died shortly afterwards at Provident Hospital in the city, aged 79. Today, her role as one of the first self-made millionaires and great African-American philanthropists has been commemorated in numerous books, television shows, and a parade in St. Louis every year, which honours her charity towards the city's orphanages and children's institutions. Notably, she features in the 2020 Netflix series Self Made, which is based on the life of Madame C.J. Walker, but this has led to some backlash, as Malone, who has been described as a friend to all mankind, is portrayed as a villain here. For our final story, we are going back to late 19th century Mississippi. The woman who has become known to history as Alelia Walker was born as Lelia McWilliams on the 6th of June 1885 in the city of Vicksburg in Mississippi. Lelia's mother was Sarah Breedlove, a woman who had been born into extreme poverty in rural Louisiana in 1867. She was the first member of her family to be born free, and her parents and older siblings had been enslaved before the American Civil War and Emancipation Act. Orphaned by the age of seven, Sarah moved to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where she began working as a domestic servant. Here, she married one Moses McWilliams when she was just 14 years of age, and three years later, their marriage resulted in Lelia, their only child. Very little is known of Lelia's father, Moses, and it isn't even clear what age he was when he married Sarah. In any event, he did not feature in Lelia's life to any large extent, as he died in 1887 when she was just two years old. In later years, Lelia would have two different stepfathers, a man called John Davis, whom her mother married in 1894 and remained wed to until they divorced in 1903, and Charles Joseph Walker, a newspaper advertising salesman that Sarah married in 1906. Lelia's life story is intrinsically linked to her mother's rise as a businesswoman. After Lelia's father died, she and her mother moved to St. Louis in Missouri, where Lelia's uncles had settled some years earlier. It was here that Sarah began learning about hair care in the 1890s, inspired to some extent by her own issues with dandruff and scalp ailments. Then, 
When the World's Fair was hosted in St. Louis in 1904, Sarah was hired as a saleswoman by Annie Malone, an African-American hair entrepreneur who had a stand at the fair. It was enough experience for Sarah to branch out on her own and set up a hair care company. Shortly afterwards, when she married her third husband, Charles Joseph Walker, she took his initials and began referring to herself as Madam C.J. Walker, and she called her business the Madam C.J. Walker Company. The Madam C.J. Walker Company soon began to meet with significant success. Sarah and her husband Charles toured many of the southern states drumming up business, while Lilia, who had spent some time studying at Knoxville College in Tennessee in the mid-1900s, was placed in charge of a mail order operation, which was established in Denver, Colorado, strategically located between the east and west coasts. It was also around this time that Lelia began referring to herself as Elelia Walker, taking her second stepfather's surname and adding an A before Lelia to add some levity to her Christian name. By the early 1910s, the Madam C.J. Walker company was booming. Sarah's business model involved training young African-American women as regional salespeople who sold a variety of products which the company manufactured including their own recipe hair loss shampoos, combs and pomade, or wax which was advertised as stimulating hair growth. By the mid-1910s, the company employed thousands of saleswomen countrywide and Sarah had become a self-made millionaire, arguably the first self-made female millionaire in American history. Elelia played a role in her mother's business throughout these years. Having established the mail order center in Denver, she subsequently moved to Pittsburgh to oversee the establishment of an office there. Then, in the 1910s, she was placed in charge of the company's sales on the east coast of America. Two five-story buildings on West 136th Street in Harlem in New York City were purchased and converted into one space, which became the company's headquarters in the city. The first floor served as the Walker Company hair parlor. The second floor housed what was termed the Lelia College of Beauty Culture, where Walker Company saleswomen and groomers were trained, while the third, fourth, and fifth floors became Elelia's home and private space for entertaining. Elelia's mother died on the 25th of May 1919 from kidney failure, at just 51 years of age. With her death, Elelia became president of the Madam C.J. Walker Company, and also a millionaire in her own right. Her fortune would equate to well over $20 million in today's money, and Elelia intended to spend this on various social and cultural endeavors. As such, while she remained president of the Walker Company for the duration of her own life and continued to act as the face of the brand, she did not take charge of the day-to-day -day running of the company in the early 1920s. Instead, the management was handed over to a team who ran it from the head office in the city of Indianapolis where the company's main distribution center had been constructed and opened in 1917. It was following her move to New York and her mother's death that Elelia entered into the activity which she would be most acclaimed for. This was her role as a patron and participant in the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem and Upper Manhattan had originally been a center of Dutch settlement in New York and was named for the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. However, in the course of the 19th century, and in particular following the American Civil War, and during the Great Migration of the first half of the 20th century, it morphed into a predominantly African-American neighborhood, as millions of black Americans left rural communities in the southern states and headed to the cities. By the start of the 1920s, Harlem was a flourishing community, buoyed up with the increase in material conditions of African-Americans and with new money coming in on the back of the economic boom of the 1920s, the so-called Roaring Twenties. It was these circumstances which had led the Walker CJ Company to establish their New York offices here in the late 1910s. The 1920s witnessed a cultural and social revival of African-American writing, poetry, music, art and fashion in the neighborhood, which has since come to be termed the Harlem Renaissance. Elelia was not a significant writer or artist herself, but she used her considerable wealth in the 1920s to provide patronage to numerous figures that were. These included John Rosamond Johnson, 
a composer and singer who gained national attention during the 1920s, the poets Langston Hughes and County Cullen, and the cabaret and vaudeville performers and comedians Bert Williams and Florence Mills. Elilia turned part of her huge mansion in Harlem into a literary salon, which hosted meetings and parties at which some of these figures interacted and shared their ideas on their work. Yet, many of these parties were full of glamour and flamboyance, and focused on pleasure over work. As a result, nearly all of Harlem probably would have wanted to attend, and despite the several hundred invitations she issued for each event, hundreds more would arrive. Every corner of her apartment was filled with guests, and it was described as being as crowded as a New York subway during rush hour. Nevertheless, it appeared as though many enjoyed the crowding. While some such as Hughes praised her activities calling her the joy goddess of Harlem's 1920s, others such as Roy Otley described her as the mahogany millionaires who spent money recklessly and wore outlandish clothes. These parties also led to considerable interaction between communities, as often white poets, writers and performers from Greenwich Village and Lower Manhattan would attend the events Alelia hosted. In 1927, she even refurbished a floor of her home and christened it the Dark Tower, for holding further events and parties. Her patronage also extended to the wider community, and Elilia became involved in numerous religious and community groups in Harlem in the 1920s. Through these, she sat on several committees charged with developing the area and providing funding for the same. She was particularly anxious to promote women's groups in Harlem during the interwar period, and all of this had an impact. The Harlem Renaissance is generally credited today with imbuing much of the African American community in the United States with a new sense of identity and pride, ones which contributed in a significant manner to the development of the civil rights movement which, in the 1950s and early 1960s, eventually ended segregation in America. In contributing to the movement, Elilia made her own mark on American history in the interwar years. Elilia also travelled extensively during the 1920s, and in her travels, tried to engage with international cultures and ideas which could be brought back to Harlem. For instance, in 1921, she went on a four-month trip to Europe, visiting Nice and Monte Carlo in the south of France, and spending time in Paris, the cultural capital of the world in the 1920s. She also visited London, Naples and Rome during her European sojourn. However, Perhaps her most noteworthy international trip was to Africa in 1922. There, she passed through Cairo before heading to the Horn of Africa to Addis Ababa, the capital of one of the only countries on the African continent which was not ruled by a European power at the time, the Empire of Abyssinia, which corresponds to modern-day Ethiopia. There she met with Empress Zudichu, the ruler of the empire, and the future Emperor Haile Zelassi who in the 1920s was regent of the Empress's government. Like many others after her, Elilia was inspired by the native African state here, and it influenced her to take a more active role in the Harlem Renaissance when she returned to America. Elilia was married three times. Her first marriage was to a hotel waiter by the name of John Robinson. When exactly they married is not clear, but it must have been when she was relatively young in the mid-1900s. The union was troubled, and the couple separated in 1911, though they did not finalise their divorce until 1914, when Elilia moved to New York. It was shortly after their informal separation that Elilia adopted a girl aged around 15 named Fairy Mae Bryant, who took the name Mae Walker. She would be Elilia's only daughter, and she never had biological children. Further marriages followed in later years. In 1919, Around the time she became president of the Madame C.J. Walker Company, she married Wiley Wilson, a doctor whom she divorced after a few years. In November 1923, while Elilia was going through her divorce, she arranged for her daughter to marry Dr. Gordon H. Jackson, the grandson of a wealthy Cincinnati coal merchant. As with many socialites of the time, this was a chance to unite two distinguished families, and Elilia was willing to spend huge amounts on the event, totaling $42,000, or about $600,000 today. The wedding was dubbed 
Harlem's social event of the season and of the year, and over 9,000 people attended the party, which took place at Walker's Irvington mansion called Villa Luaro. Yet, there was one major issue. Walker's daughter May was in love with someone else. Thus, despite the marriage going ahead and a child being born to the pair, they divorced just a year later. It was also around this time that Elilia finalised her divorce with her second husband and she soon found a new love herself, marrying Dr. James Arthur Kennedy in 1926. Nevertheless, this union too ended in divorce early in 1931. Despite these marriages, Elilia's sexuality has been a subject of discussion. Her salon in Harlem became a welcoming environment during the late 1910s and 1920s for members who were known parts of the LGBT community of the time. As described by several prominent figures of the Harlem Renaissance who attended her parties, the sexual atmosphere at these were as permissive as it could be in the 1920s. This has led to considerable speculation that Elilia herself was lesbian or bisexual, and this has increased in recent years owing to her portrayal in the Netflix series Self Made. In the show, she is in a romantic relationship with a character called Esther, and this causes tensions with her mother. Yet, in reality, this was entirely made up by the showrunners, and there is little evidence to support this hypothesis. So, while her views on sexuality were entirely liberal, we do not know of any sustained relationship she had with another woman, and her three marriages, each coming in quick succession after her previous divorce, would further seem to suggest that Elilia was heterosexual. Elilia died relatively suddenly on the 17th of August 1931, at just 46 years of age. The cause was a cerebral hemorrhage brought on by hypertension, a condition which had also contributed to her mother's premature death. When her funeral was held several days later on 7th Avenue, thousands of Harlem residents attended what was effectively a large party. She was buried at Woodland Cemetery in the Bronx next to her mother. The Harlem poet Langston Hughes dubbed her death, quote, the end of the gay times in Harlem. Following Elilia's death, her daughter May took over the running of the Madame C.J. Walker Company. It was a difficult time for the company, as the Great Depression continued into the mid-1930s and sales plummeted. Nevertheless, May sold off some of her adopted mother's assets and kept it afloat so that her own daughter, Elilia May Perry Bundles, could become the fourth president of a once again profitable company in the post-war period. The company closed its doors in 1981, but in 2020, Sundial Brands revived the brand name. This was partly in an effort to profit off the release of Self Made, a Netflix series charting the life of Madame C.J. Walker in which Elilia features as a major figure. Thus, in recent years, there has been much discussion of her life. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on these individuals, I hope you found it interesting. This was a compilation style video, let me know what you thought of the format down below in the comments and if you've already seen one of these videos or one of the people covered in this compilation, I do apologise. I hope you did learn something new and that you hadn't seen all of the content covered here. Let me know if you want more of these down below in the comments and also if you have any other suggestions, also be sure to leave them down below in the comments. I hope you guys are subscribed and have notifications turned on to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.